obstructive pulmonary disease is a group of overlapping respiratory conditions, which may include emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and asthma. To better understand these disorders, a look at the respiratory system in the normal lung will be helpful. Here are the components of the respiratory system. The nose filters, warms, and humidifies the air. The trachea, which is known as the windpipe, branches off into the right and left main stem bronchi. These airways are lined with tiny hair-like projections called cilia. These function to constantly sweep particles and bacteria upward to be coughed out. The right and left bronchi further subdivide into smaller bronchi, which terminate in tiny air sacs called alveoli. There are around 300 million of these alveoli, which are pictured here as an enlargement below the diaphragm. These air sacs make up the oxygen exchange surface of the lung. The alveoli are laced with beds of fine blood vessels called capillaries. At the surface of the alveoli, oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged. The oxygen is carried to the heart, then circulated throughout the entire body. Carbon dioxide is exhaled through the lungs. The most debilitating aspect of lung disease common to emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and asthma is breathlessness. This can be caused by several factors. One, destruction of lung tissue. The tiny air sacs where the blood gets oxygenated are destroyed, causing air to be trapped in the lungs. This is most often caused by smoking and is called emphysema. Two, obstruction of the airways with mucus. This is most common in chronic bronchitis, but may also be present in asthma and emphysema. Three, narrowing, inflammation, and spasm of the airways, which is characteristic of asthma. Management of these problems is multifaceted. It includes proper use of your medications, breathing techniques, good lung hygiene, smoking cessation, energy conservation, avoidance of infection, exercise, and for some people, oxygen use. Let's continue by looking at these topics in more detail. The first step in achieving control of your symptoms is to optimize your prescribed medications. This requires good communication with your physician about your symptoms and your response to the medicines he or she prescribes. Most medications are available in different forms. If you do not tolerate one form, a different form or dosing schedule may eliminate the problem. Your doctor can help with this if you're careful to report your response to the medicines prescribed. One of the most commonly prescribed medications in obstructive lung disease is theophylin. This drug is a bronchodilator, meaning it relaxes the muscles in the airway, dilating them, making it easier to get air in and out. This drug is available in several different pill forms. Some patients experience nausea and tremors when taking theophylline, even when blood levels are in the normal range. This may be controlled with a different preparation or dosing schedule, such as taking it only at night so you're asleep when the medication peaks in your blood. In any case, your blood level should be monitored from time to time, especially if the medication is making you have tremors, nausea, or headaches. You should also be aware that some antibiotics Cymetidine, tagamant, and phenytoin, which is dilantin, can raise your blood levels of theophylline. When new medicines are added, ask your doctor or pharmacist if they can interact with your theophylline drug. Another variable is cigarette smoking. This causes theophylline to be used up more rapidly in the blood also. Medications for breathing problems can be administered by several methods. A common way is to inhale them directly into the bronchial tubes. This avoids the side effects which may be caused by medicines that must pass through the stomach and then be absorbed into the bloodstream. Another advantage is that they can take action very quickly. The first method of inhalation we will demonstrate is the meter dose inhaler. Inhalers deliver a preset amount of medicine, but your technique is crucial for optimal drug delivery to the airways. The method we recommend is first and always shake the canister. 
and blow out all your air. Position the mouthpiece one to two inches from the lips. Next, press to dispense the medication at the same time, inhaling slowly and deeply. Hold that breath for a count of five. You'll want to wait a minute before your next inhalation. Practice this in front of a mirror until you see most of the mist is going into the mouth. Your doctor may prescribe from two to four puffs with each use. Holding the canister away from your mouth decreases the amount deposited directly on the back of the throat. It allows better mixing with air for a deeper inhalation as well. A slow inhalation is critical because a rapid, shallow breath deposits the droplets only into the large airways and doesn't give it time to flow deeper into the lungs where it's most needed. Slow, deep breaths distribute the mist much better. Holding your breath after the inhalation lets the mist settle into the airways before an exhalation forces it back out. If timing or coordination of this is difficult, which it often is, a spacer device can be used. This holds the medication suspended in air until you've had a chance to inhale it, and it reduces the need for precise timing. The aero chamber is one such easy to use spacer, and it's available through most pharmacies. Many people who experience throat irritation or coughing from their inhalers find that a spacer decreases the problem greatly by retaining the larger droplets and letting the smaller treatment particles pass through the valve into the lungs. First, remove the caps from both the inhaler and the aero chamber. Then place the mouthpiece of the inhaler into the larger rubber rimmed end of the aero chamber. As always, shake the canister. Then place the mouthpiece of the aero chamber in your mouth and seal your lips around it. Press to dispense the medication and breathe in slowly and fully. A whistle will sound to alert you if you're inhaling this too quickly. The device should be disassembled and rinsed thoroughly at least once a day to prevent clogging. To prevent running out of your inhaler, you can check on the amount remaining by floating it in a basin of water. A full canister will sink to the bottom. Three quarters full will float upright under the surface of the water. One half full will float with the top just out of the water. With one quarter remaining, it will float tilted in the water and an empty canister will surface. These metered dose inhalers are fast acting bronchodilators. They work rapidly to relax the muscles in the airway to ease breathing and enhance the clearance of secretions. For best results, these bronchodilators are taken on a regular schedule, usually four times per day. Extra puffs of these type medications can also be taken when you find yourself out of breath. Going outdoors in adverse weather, exposure to allergens, and exercise are a few of the triggers which may create a need for extra puffs. If you anticipate these situations, your doctor may encourage you to pre-treat yourself so you'll tolerate the activity better. Taking your fast-acting bronchodilator before doing this exercise program is recommended. These usually begin working within five minutes, so taking a puff at the start of warm-up should help your exercise tolerance. A few extra puffs won't hurt you, but if you notice you're requiring much more frequent use of your inhalers than is usual, this may be a signal that something else is going on. You should inform your physician and inquire about the maximum number of puffs you can use per day. Excessive use can also cause unusual tremors or nervousness, like drinking too much coffee. This is more common, though, with oral medications. There is another method of receiving these bronchodilators that your doctor may wish for you to use. If you've ever been treated in the hospital or an emergency room, you've probably used a nebulizer or aerosol treatment. This delivers larger doses of the rapid-acting bronchodilators in a mist, which is breathed over several minutes. This nebulizer is a frequently used model, which is easy to use and lightweight. It is also available in a compact, portable model with a carrying case and strap. 
Vials containing exact doses of the prescribed medication are also available for use with these systems. These unit dose medications are pre-measured for accurate dosage, easy use, and can be delivered to the home. They may also be reimbursable by Medicare. These compressors are easy to use. Begin by assembling your mouthpiece, medication cup, and tubing, which gets attached to the outlet. The unit dose medication, or medication mixed with saline if that's what you're using, is placed directly into the medication cup. The mouthpiece is then replaced, securely attached, and you're ready to begin the treatment. Turn on the compressor, and you'll see a mist begins to come through the mouthpiece. Place it between your teeth, then seal your lips around the mouthpiece, and begin to inhale deeply and slowly, pausing for a second at the end of each inhalation. Continue this until the medication is completely nebulized. When you're finished, take apart the mouthpiece and at least once a day be certain to clean it thoroughly. At least weekly, it should be cleaned with an agent that your home care company will suggest to you. A different type of bronchodilator, only available as a metered dose inhaler, is a protropium known as Atrovent. Atrovent works in emphysema and bronchitis to prevent constriction of the smooth muscles in the airway. It is very effective for some people, but it should be remembered that in order to work, it must be taken regularly, whether you feel you need it or not, because it works by a different mechanism. It does not produce a rapid, noticeable effect. Atrovent will not be of much use to you in a sudden episode of breathlessness. There are rarely any side effects from this medication. The last group of medications I will discuss are corticosteroids. These medications are sometimes useful in emphysema and bronchitis and are very frequently effective if there is a component of asthma. They work over several days to decrease the inflammation of the airways, which has proved to be a very significant problem in asthma. The oral form is prednisone a potent drug with potentially serious side effects if taken over long periods of time in large enough doses. That is why inhaled steroids are preferred for maintenance therapy. However, some patients with severe disease may require oral steroids for varying periods of time. In this event, these side effects should be reported to your physician. Major weight gain, mood swings or depression, frequent urination and thirst, visual disturbances, or bony pain. Your physician will want to weigh the risks versus benefits of this therapy. Never adjust the dose without the advice and consent of your doctor. Inhaled steroids work directly in the airway. The most common side effect of inhaled steroids is throat irritation or yeast infection in the mouth. For that reason, the mouth should be thoroughly rinsed with tap water or mouthwash after every use. Another way to decrease this unpleasant side effect is by use of a spacer, as we described earlier. Inhaled corticosteroids should be taken regularly as prescribed. These also are not rapid acting, and taking extra puffs when short of breath will not be beneficial. Whatever your medication regimen, it's so important for you to know how each medicine is prescribed and why you're taking it. Knowing its expected action and its side effects makes you a better partner in your health care. Your regimen may include several other types of medications not discussed here, but please have your physician explain to you their use. The most useful thing you learn from this tape may be the better breathing techniques. The techniques I'm going to teach you are purse slip breathing and diaphragmatic breathing. Some of you may discover you already breathe this way as a natural adaptation to help yourself. For others, it may seem very awkward, but worth your time to practice till you get it right. The potential benefits are better emptying of stale air from your lungs, slower breathing, 
and slightly improved oxygen levels in your blood. These exercises should be practiced when you're at rest and relaxed. Once you've mastered them, you'll want to use them when you exercise and during activities of daily living. They can also help reduce stress and help you relax and fall asleep more easily. Pursed lip breathing simply involves repeated exhalation through slightly puckered lips. Begin by exhaling slowly as if you were trying to bend the flame on a candle, flickering the flame as you exhale. Exhalation should take twice as long as inhalation. This illustrates how the tiny airways tend to collapse during exhalation in persons with chronic obstructive lung disease, trapping air in the alveoli or air sacs due to loss of elasticity. This contributes to your feeling of breathlessness. Pursed lip breathing creates a positive back pressure in the airways, like partially plugging the end of a garden hose with your thumb causes it to expand with pressure. This pressure is believed to keep your airways open longer, allowing better evacuation of stale air and intake of fresh oxygen. The main muscle of breathing is this large dome-shaped muscle at the base of the chest cavity, the diaphragm. During inspiration, the diaphragm contracts and moves down, which enlarges the chest cavity and allows the air to be sucked into the lungs. During exhalation, the diaphragm relaxes and moves up while the lungs empty passively through a mechanism called elastic recoil. This works much like a balloon emptying. In emphysema, there's a loss of elastic recoil, and it requires much more work to evacuate the air from the lungs. Many patients use their shoulders and neck muscles to help force air out of the lungs, but this takes a lot of energy and is tiring. A more efficient way is to recruit your abdominal muscles to give that diaphragm a push. We'll demonstrate this technique. After watching, please pause the tape, lie down with a book on your abdomen, and practice until it seems comfortable. Diaphragmatic breathing should be practiced in conjunction with pursed lip breathing. First, relax and exhale. Now inhale deeply, causing the book to rise on your abdomen. Your chest and tummy should rise together, but your shoulders should stay relaxed. Think about trying to push your abdominal contents out of the way so your chest can fill more completely. During exhalation, contract your abdominal muscles like you were trying to get into last summer's shorts. When you've perfected this technique lying down, stand up and practice it in the mirror. I'll be reminding you to breathe correctly during your exercise. Another way to maximize your breathing is by controlling the secretions in your airways. In obstructive lung disease, large amounts of mucus may be secreted in the bronchial tubes, which interferes with both breathing and getting oxygen into the blood. These secretions are, unfortunately, also the perfect setting for bacteria to grow and multiply, causing an infection in the lungs. For persons who produce less then one of these medicine cups, which is one ounce, full of secretions per day, good hydration and coughing techniques used after rising in the morning will probably be adequate. To keep the secretions thin enough to cough up easily, attention should be given to drinking six to eight, eight ounce glasses of water a day. If you have heart disease, make sure your doctor approves of the amount of fluids you're drinking. If you still have trouble with thick, sticky secretions, you may want to ask your doctor about a medication which might work to liquefy them, making them easier to mobilize. A cough which is hacking <coughs> and nonstop <coughs> results with gasping breaths and is not effective. <coughs> Controlled coughing involves the following steps. Inhale slowly while leaning slightly forward. And cough out in stair-step succession <coughs> three times while pulling the abdomen in. Pause. Breathe in slowly to prevent triggering repeated coughing spasms. You may benefit from bronchial drainage, percussion, and vibration if you routinely produce one ounce or more of mucus in 24 hours, you have a large increase 
of secretions during an episode of pneumonia or bronchitis. I will demonstrate the procedure to you, but it is important that you obtain specific instructions from your physician before attempting this procedure. You may have some other condition which would make this unsafe for you. Your doctor may suggest you drain and percuss only one side if one side is affected. There are ten positions in all. I'll only show you the four basic positions to drain the dependent sections of your lungs. Bronchial drainage takes advantage of gravity assistance by placing your head lower than your chest. Percussion or clapping and vibration helps to break loose plugs of mucus, allowing them to drain into the larger airways where they can be coughed up more easily. This should not be done within two hours following a meal. You should have a towel or just one layer of clothing over the skin to prevent irritation. Loosen any tight belts, remove any constrictive clothing before beginning. Use of the drainage positions alone may be of some help but it's best if there's also someone available to perform the percussion and vibration. Your doctor may advise that you take your bronchodilator inhaler before beginning this to help open up the airways even more. You will want to build a large mound of pillows on the floor or bed. Or what I have done is to use two foam wedges placed together to create a slant for Sherry to lie on for this treatment. Be certain that your head is lower than your lungs. Also, make sure that you're lying straight with shoulders back, hips forward. Your helper's hands should be cupped so that a hollow popping sound is made. The wrist in the arms should stay relaxed. Proceed over the front of the chest, avoiding the breast area. This is the left side lying position. Her arm is up and out of the way. She should be using her pursed lip breathing and her diaphragmatic breathing during this treatment. After a couple minutes of clapping, you may want to pause and insert some vibration. Vibration involves pressure with your hands and shaking. Inhale and exhale. Inhale, exhale. Another option which might be easier to perform is shaking. Inhale and exhale. One more time, in and out. These help to move the secretions which have been loosened into the larger airways. Following each section of cupping and vibration, you should sit up and cough to clear the secretions. After three to five minutes in each position, move on to the next location. This is the stomach lying position, and we'll repeat the same steps of clapping and vibration. The third position is right side lying. Repeat the same procedure. Notice that her knees are slightly bent. This will help to relieve stress and tension off of the back during your treatment. Remember to continue purse slip and diaphragmatic breathing throughout each position. The final position is on the back. However, if you have arthritis in your back or low back pain, this might be very uncomfortable for you. Check with your physician to see if you need this position. Keeping the knees bent will help to relieve pressure off the back. Continue as before, over the chest, avoiding the breast area, cupping and vibrating only over the lungs. Stop to cough anytime it's needed and at least in between each position. Continue the pursed lip breathing, diaphragmatic breathing throughout the treatment. If there's no one available to assist you with this, 
vibrators can be purchased from your local department store or from your health care company with your doctor's recommendation. You can get one of these hospital quality vibrators. These are used by placing them with the straps securely around your chest over the area to be vibrated for about 10 minutes in each position. These mechanical devices should really only be used with specific advice from your physician. You will know if this is effective if you're more easily able to bring up secretions following your treatments. If the treatment is being done right and this is not being accomplished, it may not be necessary for you to continue. Depending on your condition, you may need to do this only once a day or as often as three to four times daily. Ask your doctor for guidelines if he or she thinks you should receive the bronchial percussion and vibration. I would like to assume that if you have lung disease, you've already kicked the smoking habit, but experience contradicts that. I'm fairly certain that you do know smoking is the leading avoidable cause of premature death in middle age, doubling the risk of death from cardiovascular disease and cancer. But if you've smoked for many years and are finding it hard to quit, you may be thinking, why bother now? If that is your rationale, I have good news for you. A recent study published in the New England Journal of Medicine evaluated smoking among older men and women. It showed that the negative effects of smoking extend well into later life. Not only was mortality increased, but many other negative effects on health were shown. These included higher rates of physical disability, more depression, weaker bones and muscles, and poor lung function. The good news is that quitting, even in later life, still dramatically diminishes your likelihood of suffering from cardiovascular diseases such as heart attacks and strokes. Your risk, in fact, may return to the level of one who has never smoked. Quitting now should continue to improve your prospects of a healthier and longer life. Some additional reasons to quit are smokers cough, sputum production, and shortness of breath from smoking gradually improve over the first two weeks. In some people, though, it does get worse before it gets better. Your breath becomes fresher. The sense of taste is heightened. Freedom from the mess and stink resulting in a more pleasant environment for you and your family. Financial savings. Well over a thousand dollars a year if you're smoking two packs per day. If you would like to stop, here are some tips that may be of help. Plan ahead exactly when you will quit. Set a date and publicize it to your friends and family whose help you definitely must enlist. Add your own reasons to a list of why you will quit and post it someplace where you'll see it every day. Choose one main supporter and sign a contract with him or her. Begin visualizing yourself as a non-smoker in situations where ordinarily you would be smoking. Begin a moderate exercise program such as Chirobics. On quit day, Throw away all remaining cigarettes, ashtrays, and lighters. Clean your clothes or take your drapes to the cleaners to prepare for a fresher, cleaner environment. And do something special to celebrate the occasion. Avoid other smokers. Remember, withdrawal symptoms are temporary. The first one to two weeks will be the hardest. Remember, too, that alcohol weakens willpower. On dealing with the urge, review your list of reasons why you stopped and ask why should you start again. Visualize yourself as a non-smoker. Anticipate smoking triggers and plan to do something else, such as the time following a meal. Take a walk or call a friend. Prepare oral substitutes to help overcome the habit. Nibble celery sticks carrots, sunflower seeds, or gum. Remember that any weight you gain as a consequence of smoking cessation will not be nearly as hazardous to your health as smoking. Avoid any place where others are smoking. Practice relaxation techniques to favorite music 
and include your breathing exercises. In case of a relapse, recognize that nearly all successful non-smokers relapsed at least two to three times before kicking the habit. Identify what made you break and learn from it. See it as a small setback, not a major failure, and get on with your quitting efforts. To assist in your efforts, you may wish to get a prescription from your doctor for nicotine gum to help you with the discomfort of nicotine withdrawal. These symptoms may include intense cravings, irritability, anxiety, restlessness, headaches, increased appetite, and sleep disturbances. Proper use is essential for success. It should be chewed slowly and intermittently until the tingling taste is released. Then park it between your teeth and cheek for a few minutes. It is intended to be absorbed slowly through the membrane in your mouth. Continue this pattern for about 30 minutes, the duration of one piece of gum. Chew it when you have the urge to smoke. At least 12 pieces a day is recommended. Do not drink liquids while the gum is in your mouth, as swallowing the nicotine may result in nausea or heartburn. Good luck. You can do it. Three million Americans quit every year. For additional help with smoking cessation, you can contact your local branch of the American Lung Association, the American Heart Association, or the American Cancer Society. Persons with lung disease may discover they have more than the usual amount of fatigue and shortness of breath when performing activities which require them to use their arms in an elevated position. These include things such as combing your hair, shaving, or putting dishes away in a cupboard. There's a good reason why this happens. You're taking muscles away from the work of breathing, which normally help you move air in and out when the arms are in a fixed position. These muscles are located in the rib cage, and you become more dependent on them when your usual breathing muscles are so overtaxed. Walking and other routine activities no doubt cause some of you problems too. We will review some basic principles and some household tips which may help you work around some of these limitations. First, avoid rushing through tasks which are difficult. Pace yourself to allow rest periods. Plan low energy activities for your scheduled rest periods if you're someone who worries about wasting time. Do something such as letter writing or needlepoint. Reevaluate your expectations and simplify your lifestyle where you can. For example, buy a wig to wear when you must be someplace very early in the day. Use lightweight dishes or disposable dishes when you're not feeling well. Wear easy maintenance clothes and keep some ready-to-serve meals in the freezer. Don't neglect good nutrition when you're not feeling well. Use proper body mechanics to avoid straining yourself. If your legs are strong enough, your quadriceps are capable, bend at the knees to pick things up, not at the waist, keeping your back straight. This uses larger muscle groups and doesn't crowd your breathing. Carry things close to your body but do not carry when you could push. Avoid working in temperature extremes. If you must be outdoors during very cold weather, wear a wrap around your face to help warm the air before inhaling it. If you must be around dust or environmental conditions which worsen your breathing, purchase a mask at your drugstore to help to screen out the irritants. Work at convenient heights to avoid wasting energy. Use a high stool for your kitchen work or a very low stool for gardening to avoid unnecessary bending. Place a low mirror just behind the fixtures of your bathroom sink and sit to allow propping of the arms while grooming. Use wheels whenever possible for transporting things around the house. A small indoor utility cart and one for outdoors will save you trips and prevent from carrying, as well as give you something to lean on if needed. Ask your doctor or home health care provider about additional aids for daily living if you need some assistance in bathing, dressing, or getting around. Some examples are this shower chair, which sits securely in the bathtub 
and will assist you with bathing if that activity is very tiring. Another example are these walkers. There are many models available, including one with a seat for you to pause and rest if necessary while walking. Some insurance companies will even help in covering these expenses. Lastly, don't neglect your structured exercise program to help in maintaining your strength and good range of motion. This will be as much help as anything in preserving your function. Having chronic obstructive lung disease puts you at a higher risk for serious infections. So it's worth every effort to avoid them and to respond promptly when your body signals distress. For prevention, talk to your doctor about the annual flu vaccine and the one-time pneumonia vaccine. The flu shot is needed every year because of the changing strains of flu virus. Each year the vaccination is prepared based on the most recent viruses that are expected to cause illness that year. The pneumonia vaccine is only recommended once in a lifetime and protects only against the most common community-acquired pneumonia. There is no guarantee against infections by many other types of bacteria which may cause pneumonia. Unless you are allergic to these vaccinations, the minimal side effects are believed to be well worth their potential benefits. Action. Second, avoid people who are sick with colds and flu. When someone who is infected sneezes, invisible droplets are expelled into the air and may be inhaled by you. Use caution with the Kleenexes and eating utensils of ill family members. The best line of defense is meticulous hand washing after contact with potential sources of infection. A good lather and rinse is the best defense against cross-infection. Three, proper rest, exercise, and nutrition. A well-balanced diet is essential for maintaining your immune system. It's a good idea to take a one-a-day multivitamin if you have any doubt about your diet containing all the nutrients you need each day. If you're losing weight and are below your normal healthy weight, ask your doctor about nutritional supplements or consult with a dietitian to help boost your nutrition. Weight maintenance is especially critical to your health. Last, keeping the lungs clear of mucus and staying well hydrated with fluids, as discussed earlier, is also a key in prevention of infection. The other component to staying well is to recognize and respond to the early signs of infection. Number one, fever or chills is a sign your body is attempting to fight off some infection. Report a temperature over 99 degrees that lasts for over 24 hours. Two, increased breathlessness or wheezing requiring you to take more of your breathing medications than usual. Three, a change in the color of your secretions to yellow, green, or blood tinged, or an increase in the amount of secretions, or change to a thicker consistency. Four, fluid retention exhibited by swollen ankles or sudden weight gain, which may be due to heart strain related to your lung disease. Five, inability to exercise or be as active as you usually are. Six, chest pain or body aches. These signals should be reported to your doctor so he or she can decide if you need antibiotics or further evaluation. Stalling only delays treatment and increases your risk for a much more serious infection which may require hospitalization. Take any antibiotics only as prescribed for as long as they are prescribed. But if you are no better in three to four days, inform your physician. Oxygen comprises 21% of the air we breathe. If your ability to get oxygen into the blood is impaired due to your lung disease, you could need supplemental oxygen, a higher concentration of oxygen to boost what is delivered to your body's cells. Your perception of your oxygen needs is unfortunately not the most accurate indicator of your body's actual needs. Some persons grow accustomed to low oxygen levels and may not feel they need it even though their blood oxygen is dangerously low. Others may feel their breathing is easier with oxygen and wonder why their doctor doesn't prescribe it, while their blood oxygen level is quite adequate. 
This is why your blood oxygen level must be measured under different circumstances to determine your specific need. Remember, oxygen is a medication and must be carefully prescribed. If you already use home oxygen, it's important that if you have not been tested during exercise, such as cycling or walking, you should ask your doctor to determine if your current setting is accurate for your exercise or if your oxygen needs to be increased. Exercise places greater demands on your body and your muscles must extract oxygen from the blood much faster. You will tolerate the exercise much better if you're maintaining proper levels of oxygen. If you have not been on home oxygen before, but notice that you get very short of breath with exercise, please ask your doctor to determine if it's safe for you to begin this exercise program. Consistently maintaining low levels of blood oxygen can result in high blood pressure in the lungs and eventual heart failure. In one who needs oxygen, these complications can be prevented and the life expectancy lengthened by compliance with your doctor's oxygen prescription. There are two ways to measure blood oxygen. Usually, a sample of blood is drawn from an artery in your wrist and analyzed. Medicare guidelines for supplemental oxygen is an arterial pressure of oxygen of 55. Another method is to measure the percent of oxygen saturation by a finger or ear clip which sees the hemoglobin through the skin and gives a reading in percentage. 88% or lower indicates a need for supplemental oxygen. If you need home oxygen, be certain you understand exactly when and how much you're expected to use. Some doctors may order oxygen just at night or may prescribe a higher flow rate at night due to positional and breathing changes while sleeping flat, which may affect your oxygen level. There are several ways of delivering oxygen once your prescription is complete. A good home care company should come out and talk to you and assess your personal needs before setting up your system. Because Medicare reimburses the same amount for all systems, some companies may prefer to supply the least expensive system. This may not necessarily be what is best for you. I will describe briefly for you the systems currently available for home oxygen. This is the liquid system. Portable canisters are filled from a base tank at home. These can be transported either by the shoulder strap or by the stroller. Advantages to the liquid system are this canister is lightweight for the amount of oxygen it carries. Depending on the make, this holds from 5 to 10 hours at a flow rate of 2 liters per minute and weighs from 10 to 15 pounds when it is full. Also, it's more cosmetically appealing than tanks. It can even be carried in a shoulder bag. This is really the only system practical for delivering oxygen at a flow rate of over 5 liters per minute, if that should be required. Disadvantages of this system is that oxygen will evaporate from the small canister if not used immediately. Also, this base tank is too large and heavy, about 100 pounds, to be transported in most cars for travel purposes. Also, this base unit must be refilled every one to two weeks, making it a little more costly. The next system are oxygen cylinders. Portable D or E tanks are usually used with a concentrator for home use. Advantages to this system are that it is the least expensive of all systems and it's the most easily transported and used in the car on long trips. Disadvantages are that it must be used with caution due to the high pressure of the contents. Tanks are somewhat unsightly and more conspicuous than canisters. And they're heavy, a little more awkward to manipulate. An e-tank lasting just under six hours at two liters per minute. The oxygen concentrator is a stationary unit. It filters room air and provides concentrated oxygen at a rate of up to five liters per minute. Advantages of the concentrator are that it's very easy to use. Its maintenance is minimal, only requiring weekly cleaning of the filter. 
This allows mobility about the house of up to about 50 feet without moving the unit. It can be easily concealed at home as well. This is the most economic method for home use if continuous oxygen is required. The concentrator is used at home and the smaller portable oxygen tanks are used for travel and away from home. Disadvantages of the concentrator are that it runs on electricity and does cost an additional 10 to $15 per month for electricity. That is not reimbursable by insurance, but it is tax deductible. Some people are bothered by the constant low-level humming noise when the concentrator is in operation. This can be transported for travel, but it weighs around 35 to 55 pounds, depending on the make. Remember to keep all of your equipment, including your nasal cannulas and tubing, clean and well maintained. Check with your home care company about the routine cleaning procedures if you have any questions. To determine which system is most suitable, the amount of time you wish to be active and away from home must be considered. If you use a flow rate of two liters per minute or more and are away from home 15 hours a week or more, the portable liquid system is probably the best choice. Portable oxygen cylinders may be recommended if your oxygen flow is lower than two liters a minute and your time away from home is less than 15 hours per week. The concentrator should then be used in the home for the remainder of the time. A competent home care company will be able to assist you in your travel plans, whether you wish to fly, drive, or cruise. There are some advantages in this respect to using a national company. Your need for oxygen should not preclude you from living a quality life, continuing the activities that make it meaningful. We will conclude with a bit more information on exercise, since that's what half this program consists of. Cherobics is designed to give you all of the components of a comprehensive exercise training program. These are flexibility. This is achieved by performing a series of stretches after the muscles are warmed up. Cardiovascular endurance. This is accomplished by performing any activity that involves large muscle groups in sustained rhythmic movement at a moderate intensity reflected by your heart rate and breathing. These type of activities include walking, swimming, bicycling, stair climbing, and aerobics. Last, muscle strength and endurance. This is developed by moving specific muscle groups against resistance. It is achieved through weight training. We begin with light weights such as soda pop bottles. Whether your exercise is limited by lung disease, heart trouble, arthritis, being overweight, or partially paralyzed, if this exercise is new to your routine, you should take it slow. Remember, the duration of time is more important than the intensity, so it's best to do your movements in half time to the music and last a little longer. It should be your goal to progress from however long you can tolerate the exercise on your first attempt up to being able to complete the entire routine. This will get your duration of exercise up to around 30 minutes. You may do this by adding five minutes each week to your exercise time. After reaching a duration of 30 minutes, you may then concentrate on increasing the intensity of your exercise. This is accomplished by making larger movements, increasing the speed as tolerated, and increasing the number of repetitions of a certain movement or standing for some of the routines. The intensity should only be increased if it can be done within the limits of your target heart rate and breathing guidelines. The frequency of your exercise is the third critical component to your exercise prescription. You should strive for a minimum of three times per week. For best results, four to six days is preferred. I recommend you give your muscles a day of rest between each time you use the aerobics tape and alter your exercise routine to include other activities you enjoy. One of the best and most accessible modes is walking. In bad weather, you can find a mall to walk in. This is an excellent way to balance your exercise program. As with aerobics, gradually increase your tolerance by taking rest as needed until you can stroll at a steady pace for 30 minutes. Whatever mode of exercise you're using, 
be sure to utilize your breathing techniques to maximize your ability. Be certain to discuss any concerns or problems regarding your exercise with your physician. Look briefly at this graphic description of what a workout should look like. This applies to whatever type of exercise you're doing. During the warm-up, your heart rate should gradually increase from your resting level to your target heart rate. During the endurance phase, you should maintain that target heart rate. During cool down, we want to see your pulse return to the resting level. The relaxation should assist it in doing so. If you start out with good intentions, but find yourself distracted or too busy to exercise, here are some tips to keep you on track. Set aside a specific time for exercise and plan everything else around it. Invite a friend or relative to exercise with you to break the boredom. They will benefit too. Reward yourself with some special treat after you have achieved your exercise goal for a week or a month. Replace negative self-talk about how tired or bored you are with affirming thoughts of how committed you are to your health. And applaud yourself for keeping your priorities straight. Think how you're increasing your stamina, returning to a healthier you. Of course, if you're ill with a fever or respiratory infection, the most appropriate thing to do is to rest. That's not a time to push yourself. Otherwise, keep it up to achieve a healthier you, making the very best of what you have. Congratulations on taking the most important step beginning.